Okay, welcome everybody to this day zero session on graphs and sovereignty. For starters, I'd like to invite everyone who's sitting in the back rows to maybe come to the uh, tables and take some of those seats. There are no invisible people sitting there, um, so all of those seats are free. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming, um, and I wanted to briefly introduce the Otherwise Network, um, which is a, an interdisciplinary network based in Germany. Um, you can see some of its members here. Um, it's a network of uh, thinkers, practitioners, and writers um, who work interdisciplinarily um, on internet-related questions, um, and essentially aim to open up new perspective questions and discussions about the internet through uh, our cooperation. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce one of our own members, uh, Christoph Engemann, who's a postdoc at the Bauhaus University in Weimar um, for Society and Digital Media, and who will be speaking about graphs and sovereignty today. So without further ado, um, please welcome Christoph. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming in on this Monday morning, uh, big menu, uh, small group. That's wonderful. Um, I'm honored to speak here at the United Nations Internet Governance Forum. Um, and I'd like to present uh, some material and some work uh, we've been discussing uh, within the Otherwise Network, um, and which we believe poses uh, difficult and thorny questions for internet policy making. Um, that said, um, we don't offer, or at least I don't, because I'm an academic, a humanities scholar on top of that, uh, solutions uh, but uh, problems. So the idea here is to complicate matters and to open up a discussion on the questions of the relation between graphs and sovereignty. Um, my talk, where's my little clicker here, um, is structured as follows. Um, I will. Uh, start with a few remarks on uh, the sovereignty turn. I will then explain a little bit what graphs are, and on the third part, um, I will um, discuss uh, the material presented and its relation to the ideas of sovereignty. So, um, coming to the sovereignty turn, um, two Canadian uh, anthropologists recently published a paper um, what does the notion of sovereignty mean when referring to the digital? And in this paper, uh, they presented this table showing that we are seeing a sharp increase in the usage of the term sovereignty uh, in connection with uh, uh, topics related to the digital. Um, the three most prominent terms they identified are data sovereignty, technological sovereignty, and digital sovereignty. There are, of course, others, uh, cyberspace sovereignty, for example. And as you can see, while the uptake is relatively low in academic contexts, especially for data sovereignty in the past uh, three or four years, uh, there is a sharp increase, uh, which is nicely re reflected um, by um, the developments in Germany because just yesterday, the Christian Democratic Union uh, published um, a paper uh, where they are uh, proposed to put data sovereignty, Datensouveränität, um, into the center of the, of the, of the digital policy um, they want to uh, do for Germany and, of course, for Europe. So, um, oh, that was too fast. I'm sorry about that. So, uh, Couture and Topin uh, proposed that what we are seeing is a sovereignty turn. Um, as opposed to debates in the 90s and in the, in the uh, first decade of the 2000s, uh, where it was generally um, discussed where the relationship between the nation state and the internet was generally discussed um, as an opening or blurring of borders and an eventual decline of the nation, nation state, um, a diminishing role of the nation state within digital societies. Um, as Couture and Turpin say, and I think as it's evident, especially in an in a environment like uh, this forum here, is that the nation state is back, uh, and then it, that it asserts its role when it comes to digital media and the internet. Um, and this uh, strange word I put up here um, refers to the case of China, because I believe, especially for the West, the debate about uh, China's um, uh, Sesame social credit system and general internet uh, policy 
uh, can be characterized as Angstlust. It's difficult to translate, but I think it's a pretty clear what this means. It's a actually a psychonetic term. Um, angst, fear, uh, or despair, because um, the general public in the West um, is afraid uh, that this uh, dystopian model of internet governance and also social policy could become uh, reality f uh, also in open democratic societies uh, and lead to um, surveillance on an unprecedented level. But I also believe that there is something like desire, uh, like lust in this debate, because of course, of course the allocation potency that something like a Sesame social credit system, if it exists or not, is an open question. Um, but the allocative powers um, and the granularity of allocation that you could organize with such a system are, of course, desirable to policymakers worldwide. Um, we are working, uh, especially in social policies, uh, policies with aggregates. Aggregates like uh, unemployed, employed, healthy, unhealthy people, pensioners, and so forth. Um, and the principles of solidarity and subsidiarity operate on these aggregates. Once you can target individuals and um, establish a relation between populations, individuals by digital means, and that is what the Chinese model presents, you have a different allocative power and you have a new discussion about uh, basically what is a just social policy. And I believe this is the, the last part, the desire part in the debate about China. Um, we will only very briefly touch again on this. We can probably talk about this in a debate. It bears a relation to graphs, uh, which I don't make very clear in what's I'm what I'm showing now, but which uh, you should uh, keep in the back of your mind because it's basically implicit to what graphs do. Okay, so sovereignty turn. Um, why bring graphs into this discussion? Um, I believe the material I'm about to present uh, put, uh, shows very clearly that we need to talk about the relation between, gra between graphs and sovereignty. Um, this doesn't mean that we want to introduce something like a new term here, like another term that goes up in a table like that, that would be graph sovereignty or something, or as I said in the beginning, that we can uh, provide some sort of solution to this problem. So um, let me present you um, the material that brings forward what I uh, just said. In order to do that, I have to give a little bit of background. I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with the notion of the graph and what that is. So I will give a very, very brief and a rough uh, outline of what graphs are. Um, graph theory is actually, actually a mathematical um, or computational, depends on whom you ask, um, concept stems back um, to an historical event. This is uh, the city of Königsberg and the Seven Bridges. And uh, the Swiss mathematician Leonhard Euler in the 18th century could show that you could um, solve the question if there is a pass where you don't cross these uh, bridges twice um, via a mathematical model that basically abstracts from the topological or geographical reality of what you're seeing here. And that abstraction could be depicted like this. Um, so you basically model um, the land masses as points and the connections to bridges as edges. Um, you could also uh, model uh, or depict it as that. Uh, the important part here is that actually not this graphical representation counts, but the abstraction into um, algebraic, uh, uh, into an algebraic um, code like this, vertices and edges, uh, with which you can then um, basically compute um, pretty much any kind um, of data where you could, where you can create, um, and where you can describe entities as nodes and their relations as edges. Um, this has found applications in many fields, um, chemistry, biology, um, and especially in the social sciences where it gave rise to social network analysis since the 1950s, mostly or originally in the context of the question, what are informal networks and companies? Um, who talks to whom? And it eventually became important um, also for computer science where it's one of the most powerful um, 
data uh, structures, which is used uh, for file systems, for, comp uh, for compilers, and many, in many other applications. So, um, so far for, for the br brief uh, entry, um, it is important to understand, I, I said that before, that we should not think about this visual depictions of graphs. The logo of this event has, has this globe that is actually also nodes and edges. You'll find it everywhere, and if you think back, for example, to the Cambridge Analytica logo, which was a brain that was depicted as a graph. Um, the power of these, of these concepts lies not in this visual uh, dimension, but uh, in the computability of um, entities and their relations. Okay, so, oh, there's a slide missing, well. Um, what, ha what does this have to do with um, our contemporary situation? The um, consultancy Gartner in 2012 published a white paper, which I still don't have, and if anybody has access, please send it to me. I only have parts of it, um, where, they, uh, where they say that um, the current consumer web, so what we today would call platforms, um, can be characterized by five graphs which deliver a sustainable advantage. And these five graphs, this is from the same white paper, are the social graph. The social graph is owned by Facebook. Um, it's the intent graph, uh, which uh, you could translate to search, because if you have an intention, uh, what you do is um, you type something in a search box to follow up on that intention. You want to book, uh, you know, an airplane or something like that. It's a consumption graph, uh, which is owned by Facebook, um, which is the graph of basically all of the goods you can buy and um, the possible uh, connections they have. It's the interest graph, which is a little more difficult to uh, describe where it belongs to. Um, this is a mix between Twitter, Tumblr, uh, Pinterest, uh, and many other of these um, uh, smaller social networks where you basically spend your time with your aspirations. You know, you look for what you strive to become or what you're interested in. And it's the mobile graph, which, uh, which refers to mobile phones. Um, which is also a graph that has not been monopolized to the extent that the social graph and the internet graph has been monopolized. The mobile graph is uh, split between the telcos, telecommunication companies like uh, Deutsche Telekom, uh, Vodafone and so forth. And of course, and we don't know exactly, uh, between Google and Apple, because since they have the operating systems, they also should have at least that can be inferred, access to who talks to whom, and hence have a mobile graph. So what we are currently seeing is basically the fight for uh, the acquisition of the mobility graph. Um, that is relating uh, places, people, um, and routes, uh, and uh, abstracting that to a graph. Um, there is meso, micro, macro mobility, which are probably different graphs, and it's probably an interesting program, uh, problem to understand how they overlap and what the economic advantages of these um, particular graphs are. But the reason why we see all this bike trash everywhere uh, is um, that these companies try to graph out um, how people travel uh, uh, short distances. So, uh, Benedict Evans, one of the um, picture book uh, venture capitalists of the Silicon Valley, uh, in 2018 tweeted, it's a truth universally acknowledged that a founder in possession of a good graph must be in want of an investor. Um, this shows that, at least in these, in these circles, um, they understand the strategic value of a graph, and um, that that's probably something that venture capitalists look for um, if somebody comes with a business plan. Is there a graph that uh, is uh, able to capture um, uh, large instances of entities and, and interesting relations in this business plan? Um, it's interesting that he says that 2018. I believe uh, in venture capitalist circles in the Silicon Valley, this has been understood relatively early, probably around 2000. I think Google demonstrated um, with PageRank and the search engine the value of a graph. And what we've seen in the first decade with the rise of social media is uh, competition between business models um, 
built upon graphs. LinkedIn would be another example where you have basically an employ employability graph, whatever you want to call that. Right? Okay, so far for the economic sphere. Um, so the question now, how about governments and graphs? Um, is there anything that we can find where we can see that graphs have become something like an asset in government context? And uh, there actually is. Um, after the Snowden revelations, the uh, German uh, Bundestag um, uh, found an investigative committee for an inquiry, to, inquiry in the NSA spying on German citizens and politicians. Um, WikiLeaks leaked uh, some of the transcripts of this uh, meeting. And there's one that's especially interesting where William Binney, who used to be the former technical director of the NSA, roughly between 1998 and 2002, I believe, um, is questioned uh, by this investigative committee uh, and the members of the parliament. Uh, and they ask him, what did you guys do at the NSA? And Bini answers, we built a, a relationship model, which we call a graph, a social network of the world. What is interesting in this answer is that he refers to a time frame of 1998-1999. Uh, so this is very early. And for anybody uh, familiar with the complexities and the technical requirements in acquiring a large-scale graph, and the world is a very large-scale graph, um, this is actually astonishing. Um, interestingly, nobody from the, in, this, uh, in this committee, none of the members of the parliament asked Binny, so what's a graph? Either they are familiar with this, ab with this abstraction, with this concept of a graph, or they didn't understand the relevance. He talks twice about this in his transcript, right? The questions they field, um, are about his career and his pay grade and so forth, right? There is no further inquiry within at least the transcripts we have available in what kind of strategic value does William Binney ascribe uh, to graphs, right? Um, Binney talks about thin threat. Uh, Thomas Drake and William Binney are two NSA whistleblowers who have been prosecuted for this whistleblowing. Uh, thin threat was, the, was basically the graph engine, the graph database they built in this time frame, uh, which had provisions um, to ensure the privacy of US citizens. And uh, the internal struggle that erupted after 9-11 was the question if these uh, privacy provisions for US citizens uh, would be um, uh, excluded or uh, uh, taken back from this uh, program. And uh, these two actually resigned uh, over this. And the project that, that, that was then implemented, a uh, code named Trailblazer, um, also allowed to graph out the US population alongside all other populations they would graph out. Um, Binny, um, there's a couple of um, uh, present, uh, presentations, uh, PowerPoint slides um, available. Uh, that he gave where, ex where he explains um, how this graphing out of the world uh, works and how you pull out um, interesting uh, communities, subgraphs, subgroups. Um, here, uh, this is from one of these presentations. Uh, you can see how you identify sub subject, uh, suspects, sorry, um, or the zone of suspects and um, how the separations, the orders of separations play a role in that. Um, there's more evidence in 2006 um, after having problems um, with the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, the US military, the US army, uh, more precisely published uh, its um, counterinsurgency field manual. The last counterinsurgency field manual was published during the Vietnam War. Uh, it was viewed as an abject failure um, and um, David Petraeus, later CIA director, was tasked with writing this um, counterinsurgency manual. Uh, this book is actually readworthy. Um, if only half of the stuff that's, that's being said about the Iraq war and the Bush, administra Bush administration in the first decade is true, it's pretty crazy, on the level crazy of the administration we have now. So, in this counterinsurgency manual, you will find an appendix uh, describing social network analysis as an important tool um, in the war on terror. And in this example, they show um, you have an insurgent subgroup B, um, and you have um, 
uh, certain um, uh, means that you uh, can employ or deploy in order to shape that graph. And this notion of shaping is important. I will go talk further about this in a moment. Um, as you can see, what you do, you uh, call and search snap and grab or uh, distribute food. Food. This is called non-kinetic shaping, meaning you don't uh, you use non-lethal means uh, in order to um, create basically communication among the insurgents, uh, and this communication will allow you to study the graph, um, to study their relationships, um, and eventually reveal the important persons within uh, this group. Um, this is called density shift here. So shaping is this uh, term that you will find in this doctoral literature that has um, emerged in the, basically in the past decade. If you look, um, for example, at West Point Military Academy or other military academies, you will find tons and tons of papers on uh, network analysis um, and the question, how do you operate on a social network? Um, and how, how you shape it. As I said, there's basically two means of shaping, non-kinetically, non-lethal means, bribery, um, or any kind of other stress that you can um, generate uh, on kinetic shaping, which is basically killing people. There's an interesting people, uh, paper on this problem, a very cynical paper. It's called Shaping Operation to Attack Robust Terror Networks, a Robust Terror Networks, uh, written by Devin Keller and others from the um, um, West Point Military Academy, the, what is it, the Network Science Center there. And they introduce, um, let me go here, um, an algorithm that you can feed uh, with the data of a known social network. And this algorithm will identify nodes whose removal will increase um, the network-wide centrality. So this is basically uh, an algorithm that offers targeting recommendations. Because once you remove a node, um, um, according to this algorithm, the uh, communication that happens after this attack uh, will eventually reveal the important person within uh, the subgroup. This is uh, from this paper. This is a data set of the 1998 uh, USS Cole bombing by Al Qaeda. This is actually an open data, an open source data set that's used for many um, uh, demonstrations to show um, the validity and viability of these algorithms or of projects. Um, and it basically, I got some laser here, and that's great. Um, in this, uh, in phase A, you don't know who actually bin Laden is in this network, right? So the algorithm um, is fed this network and will then suggest which node to take out here, leading to this situation. It will then again suggest which node to take out, and eventually you arrive here where you know that this node is bin Laden. Right? Um, so this is part of the, uh, the so-called shaping doctrines. Um, there is also another literature that has come from these academies. Um, this is from the, from the Navy Academy in, uh, at the West Coast. I forgot the town. There's an aquarium there, Monterey. Um, the, the technical term that's employed in this context is dark networks. Dark networks are networks of people who don't want to be identified. And this, of course, is a question, um, how do you... Uh, handle these networks where people uh, communicate securely and in, with encrypted fashion or, or any other means that uh, make it difficult to actually identify a community or a group within a, a larger scale graph. Uh, there's many books um, discussing the problem, how you illuminate dark networks, how you disrupt them, and so forth. Uh, this has become, as, as far as I believe, um, part of the military toolbox. And not only in the US, uh, this of course uh, is being studied worldwide. How do you get a graph if people don't use Facebook like we do all day or Twitter or any kind of other social media? Um, in the case of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the US military for a brief period of time um, hired anthropologists and um, 
had this anthropologist go into the field, into the villages, and ask people questions like these. What five people here have you known the longest? What five people here has been most recently in contact? Who are the most important people? And who are the most important people in this particular town? Um, this data is then entered in a program that's similar to this. This is the human terrain, and the, the term is really interesting here, um, because the military essentially says we are not operating on a terrain anymore, we are operating on a population, on a human terrain. Um, this is the MAP, um, MAP HT, MAP Human Terrain Toolkit, um, where you could enter, uh, oops, I'm sorry, this is not a laser, how do I go back, sorry. Uh, you could enter the data, um, which are the most, five most important people, you would have a geographic overlay and you would here have this nice little graph that would tell you the um, uh, relations between the people and here you have an event navigator, right? Where you could, could see um, the network development, the density shifts, the centrality developments and so forth um, before and after events. For example, food distribution or after the explosion of an IED and so forth. There's also commercial. Um, software available for um, that does similar things. This is IBM's Analyst Notebook, um, which uh, I tried to get licensed to, but they didn't answer after I sent in my application for that. It's basically uh, uh, a social network analysis uh, toolbox uh, that can be uh, deployed in many contexts, could be also used in commercial contexts, uh, for example, for advertisement and so forth. And of course, um, wait, go here. The big commercial entity in this context is Palantir. Uh, Palantir is basically in the service of illuminating dark networks. And um, the offer they make is, uh, is a graphing engine, a graphic, graphic, graphing, sorry, uh, a graph engine um, that is capable capable to ingest uh, unstructured data. That, uh, and that is, uh, I think, uh, the unique selling point. Um, they make it very easy to take whatever data you have, enter it into this engine, and then get a usable graph back on which you can uh, make decisions. Okay, to go back here, what I just skipped. Um, this is from the Snowden files. Um, from a GCHQ, from, a, from the uh, United Kingdom's uh, um, signaling uh, intelligence um, uh, institution, uh, a program called Treasure Map. And this is interesting because it leads over to this question of what are the sovereignty implications that we have with graphs. And as you can see here, they describe to their customers that you have the ge geographical layer down here, which they see as part of their mission to map that out. out. You have the physical network layer, which is all the um, cables uh, and wireless connections, routers, and whatever you could um, put into this, uh, into this box. And you have the logical network layer, which is the network addresses. Right? And um, Mapping out these three layers and their relation um, enables to create something like a cyber persona layer, um, whatever that exactly is. Uh, it's interesting that on the cyber persona layer, they only show computers and cell phones. So uh, in this approach, a, perso a persona is somebody who is connected um, to the via logical addresses, via physical network, and has a geographic location um, via some kind of digital device. Could be a variable, could be a phone, could be a computer, or anything else, right? And what that in turn enables is the persona layer. You create nodes, which is the persona, and map out their relations, which, which are the, uh, the uh, edges here. Um, there is a couple more. Um, documents in the uh, Snowden um, uh, in the Snowden files. There's probably many more that we don't know about. Um, this is the data mining research problem book. It's a 150-page uh, problem book that 
was uh, written in 2011. It's interesting to read. Um, it deals with the problem of graph analysis, especially uh, graph analysis um, uh, of flow data, so data that um, uh, only streams, or, uh, I'm sorry, streaming data, uh, data that only is there for a short period of time and then disappears. That's one part of it. The other part of this book, and it's really interesting, is basically machine learning. So they were pretty early in the game. This is before AlexNet, which is 2012, before the big wins we saw with uh, um, object recognition um, that led to the current AI revolution. Okay, so talked about Palantir already. This is, as you can see, if this is from the material Palantir has. There's not much material online. If you look at the uh, YouTube videos, it's interesting. But this is basically here a little uh, icon showing there. Uh, it, it's interesting that it looks like a Mac, Mac, old Mac interface there. Anyhow, uh, where they show that they basically offer to graph out your data. Okay, so what does what I just show uh, mean for the question of sovereignty? To recap a little bit, it should have become clear that graphs are important economic and geostrategic assets. Um, Mark Zuckerberg uh, coined the term of the social graph, and whenever you see pictures of Zuckerberg on the stage, you will see him standing in front of some kind of graph visualization. Right? Um, we have seen the military and um, intelligence service uh, sort of approaches to graphing and the importance um, they assign to this, uh, this concept and this approach. And um, as I said, I think um, it has become clear that uh, powerful uh, actors in our world view graphs, graphs or social graphs as economic and geostrategic assets and that we are in something like an age where geopolitics are graph politics. One important feature of graphs is that graphs need liveliness. They are dynamic. They need traffic. A graph where there is no traffic goes stale. That means um, you need to reactualize your data you have about the entities you are graphing out um, on a relatively permanent basis. In order to do that, you have to generate traffic. And among the means of generating traffic is for example, are for example things like fake news and memes and so forth. They both drive engagement, that is the generation of traffic, as well as they allow you to map out communities and sub-communities. And that's what you see in all these fake news debates when people present you all these groups that don't talk with each other or only have uh, weak ties and so forth. Um, so I think uh, it's, uh, it's possibly worthwhile to think about fake news memes and so forth as shaping operations, um, which are done by everybody, uh, not only the, the people we put in the bad people box. Of course, this idea has already found uh, the minds of some smart people. This book uh, published uh, by Anne-Marie Slaughter in 2017, The Chessboard and the Web, makes a clear reference to Brzezinski's grand chessboard uh, metaphor of uh, geopolitics. Um, Anne-Marie Slaughter used to be the, policy, the head of policy planning uh, under uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, in um, the Department of State, I think between, I forgot the exact years, anyhow, under, uh, under Clinton, so during the Obama administration. And Anna-Marie Slaughter does two things with this book. First of all, the first 60 pages are an introduction to graph theory. It's, it's really read-worthy, it's a quick read. She will tell you everything I told you, a little more uh, substantiated and, and, uh, and uh, tell you where to read uh, more about it. And then she says, um, our geopolitical thinking in blocks uh, and in territorial means is uh, not applicable to our cur uh, current situation anymore. We have to think about networks. Interestingly, she doesn't give an answer how that really should look like outside of keep networks open, to which any adversary or any other country probably says, 
open networks are of course an invitation to open other countries to graphing, right? So we are getting into an interesting debate. I will follow up on this uh, in a moment about inside and outside. There's another book I want to highlight by Niall Ferguson, a historian who wrote this book, The Square and the Power, uh, published in 2018, very similar. First 50 pages, introduction to graph theory, and then he makes the argument that history so far, so the discipline of, acad of history, academic history, um, only studied formal relations because it, um, uh, all the research uh, was built upon documentation, and documentation uh, only captures formal communication. And he says, what we, don't, what we didn't see in history is the importance of informal communication. And he believes um, that uh, by graphing out certain relationships uh, between individuals, um, a different perspective of view on history can be, can be built. So these developments begin to enter the public discourse, the, the discourse of public intellectuals. What I want to discuss with you now is uh, what do we do with uh, what I just presented. I think it's pretty clear that power in international relations these days projects itself through and with graphs. Um, they're an important part, um, at least for um, intelligence services and also in military operations, and they're important um, in business geopolitics, if you want to call them like that. What we're seeing is something, is there any Schmidtian in the room? Karl Schmidt? Okay. Um, what we're seeing is something that I would call Grafennamen or graph appropriations. Uh, Karl Schmidt uh, famously uh, coined the term Landnamen, land appropriations, Seenamen, sea appropriations, and Luftnamen air appropriations. The point he makes, and I'm not a Schmidtian myself, but the point he makes is that whenever you have the introduction of a new technological means, that is the measurement of land, that is the ability to navigate the sea, that is um, machinery to um, put um, people in the air, you have new problems of localization and order. Ortung und Ordnung is the alliteration in German. And that these new um, means of localization of order basically lead to, a new legal, to new legal problems and new legal regimes. Of course, Schmidtchen is a conservative. We can talk about that in the discussion. Um, because for him, all law basically rests in controlling uh, the um, dem, dem Boden, den Grund, also uh, the earth, right? Um, and you're not far from the Nazi ideology there. Anyhow, what's interesting is that he connects technical means um, of knowledge about a space to the problem of order. And I, be I believe what we have with graphs is a new means of auto, a new means of localization, and we don't know yet what order comes from that and what forms of order we need to have, right? So we have the auto, the localization through graphs. Now, graphs provide certain problems. With a map and a territory, you have a clear uh, delineation between the inside and the outside. And the notion of sovereignty rests upon the ability to manage that delineation because sovereignty is defined as the ability to uh, prohibit an outside actor to act upon your territory, uh, to act upon what you deem as inside. Um, what's the outside of graphs if you graph the whole world? Like something that everybody does all the time. Facebook does this, uh, the NSA does this. Uh, uh, probably the Moldavian uh, uh, intelligence services do this. Right? So how do you define the inside and outside? And if you start to separate graphs, your territorial graph or your population graph, like 
countries like China do or attempt to do um, from the outside, uh, from other graphs or from, from basically traffic with the outside world, um, we at least, if you have a, a liberal democratic world order in mind, uh, in attention here because you have to prohibit, you, you have a conflicting desire between prohibiting and enabling movement of data, goods, and people, right? Which is always the problem of sovereignty. You want movement of people, goods, of data because that's what economic activity is. Um, but at the same time, you want to have some control over it. And under conditions, um, under some conditions, probably prohibited, prohibited entirely, right? And this becomes very complicated if you apply this, this graph concept on this. Okay, so the challenges, and there's probably many more, this list is not exhaustive, is how do you define the inside and outside? What does this mean for graph acquisition, processing, and storing? Should there be onshore and offshore? So this problem of graph locality or data locality comes, um, raises its head here again. How much in which interconnectivity do you allow? Under what con conditions? How can you obfuscate graphs? Um, how can you make a graph? How you can you make your country basically illegible? And last not least, and this is the main point that we also want to make, so far all the debates about uh, regulation and any form of digital sovereignty focus on the individual and its rights. We believe we need to talk about aggregates. And a graph is one form of the aggregate uh, in a powerful form that needs to be discussed uh, in its policy dimension. And I leave it with that. Thank you. OK, so um, thank you very much for that extremely interesting uh, presentation. Um, I think it's really interesting. I, I really appreciate how you show essentially how the abstraction and making kind of like social relations computable is something that then in itself has implications for knowledge and then again um, implications for policy action. Um, I'm going to start out with like two or three brief questions for Christoph um, and then we move to Q&A so if you have any questions uh, please stay around. Also um, if you're sitting in the back feel free to move to some of the tables around uh, in this circle. Um, if there's nobody sitting on a seat that means it's free um, so you can feel free to take it. Uh, Christoph. For starters, I was wondering, because you described graphs um, towards the end of your presentation as a way of projecting national power. Um, so I want to challenge you a bit on your sovereignty characterization. Um, and I want to ask you why you're talking about graphs as means of sovereignty rather than just another way in which states can project power onto people around them. Or, for example, in the case of the United States, um, how they project military power outside of their own country. Sorry. Uh, well, I think what I, I like this this uh, term you just uh, brought forward: uh, social relations computable. Um, I think that's what happened, um, and and graphs can be described as as basically the abstraction that allows that. Right? Um, if a nation state's role is um, to protect and serve, or whatever you want to call that. Um, its population, right? Any means that can infer with that via computational means are a problem to the state. And this is what we're seeing here. Um, it is difficult to, well, how, let's do it this as an example. Um, once you accept that probably um, you can create uh, internal tensions and divisions in a population via graph shaping, for example, fake news and stuff like that, right? Um, the question of sovereignty is touched, right? Uh, for the state where this happens, right? That has to deal with that. Um, hence, I believe um, that, that, that 
you know, employing the notion of sovereignty, I'm not happy with doing that, actually, right? As I don't think sovereignty is a good thing, um, but it's, it's a reality um, that we have to uh, deal with. Um, so once that happens, you, you enter basically the realm of this, the connotations of sovereignty and have to, have to manage to find an answer to that. So I think in general this is also an interesting extension to theories of sovereignty as they've kind of been developing over the past few years because we used to think of state sovereignty as defined through controlling territory and resources. Mm -hmm. um, and then increasingly over the past decades we've kind of moved towards um, some understandings, I think Anne-Marie Slaughter was part of that as, of sovereignty like as existing in networks, but then there's also, um, I think this w argument was made in How to Hide an Empire, that what you no longer need to actually control territory, but it's actually sufficient to control the nodes in a network. Mm -hmm. And as long as you control nodes, or as long as you, I guess, control important nodes, you can influence and shape operations within yeah. another country. Yes. Um, just by affecting those. Um, so all of this sounds so far pretty scary. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious whether you think there are maybe positive uh, conclusions to draw from this. Like, what are like? Is this just another means by which states can essentially exert national power um, and impact and threaten each other, or is there a positive perspective yeah. to be drawn from this material? Um, yes, thank you. That's actually two questions. <laughs> um, let me answer the first one: the relation between. Um, the control of territory and the control of, uh, how, how do you call that, Con uh, points of entry? Um, nodes. nodes of entry, which nodes is already graph talk, in a way, right? Uh, graph lingo. Um, I think, yes, that's true, um, but that doesn't mean that the role of the territory is diminished. Um, let me show you something to make this argument. Um, so, Louis André Barroso and Urs Hölzle, um, I think Hölzle is the chief technology officer at Google, published a small, it's just one page, article uh, in 2016 where they say handheld plus landheld equals cloud computing. So they make this connection between, where's my phone? It's not here, my phone and the data centers that crunch the data that allow this graphing I was talking about. And they assert that the landhelds are equally important. Landhelds are the data centers that have to sit somewhere and need power, uh, clean air, cold air, and so forth, right? So um, these, these are difficult to describe. They're, are these the nodes of entry, or are these the nodes of entry, right? Um, these distinctions blur, right? This is, again, this problem of the inside and outside that's, that's becoming unclear with this technology. But I think we can take it for granted that the NSA doesn't build this for fun, right? Um, this is their data center in Utah. Um, they don't put it on some island in the Pacific or in, you know, into Saudi Arabia and so forth. Um, data locality man matters, right? So there is a certain territoriality to graphs and big data, of course, um, that plays into this, uh, what I'm trying to describe here. The second question is, what can we do positively with this? I don't know. Um, um, I mean, an economist would say new markets have emerged, right? We have social media, uh, we have all kinds of things um, that help us to uh, get quicker, easier, and cheaper to goods, uh, and so forth. What would a policymaker in inter international relations say what this brings forward? That's, that's a difficult question. I don't know the answer to that, right? So then I also just lastly, I wanted to follow up on your um, argument about the, in, your question about the individual, because I actually have a more specific question in that regard. Um, you mentioned this, the two challenges are what this means for individuals, and another challenge is how to obfuscate these things, um, or how to obfuscate a graph. And the way it seems right now is that it doesn't even matter, the government doesn't even need to be able to see what you're doing because your social relations with the people around you, and as long as you interact, you're essentially revealing information constantly, and you give other actors 
um, information about where they can kind of like hit you to get even more information that they want from you and about your social networks. Um, so is there no way of essentially hiding from this other than just ceasing to interact with individuals or people around you? Um, good question, um, and I'm, I actually cannot really answer it because uh, I don't understand the discourse about this well. There is uh, a computer science debate on graph, graph obfuscation. So the question of how do you make a graph illegible or unusable by introducing basically data into the graph um, that does something like camouflage or something similar. For example, whenever you make a call, you make 10 calls, but only one of these calls goes to your real um, person or the, the, the address you want to talk with, whereas the other 10 calls basically obfuscate the, the graph. There is an event, but th this event um, happen or is um, concurrent with 10 relations created. So the question that all these tools that I showed uh, try to answer, what event is connected to what relation becomes obfuscated, right? So um, you could build an infrastructure where that's baked in, right? Who could do this? Apple could do that, or Google could do that. With Google, they probably, I mean, they're cryptographic means that would allow you, it's basically similar to differential privacy, uh, to mathematically um, uh, basically uh, compute, uh, how do you say, reverse these, uh, these, uh, this false data so you can operate on that or you know, can, can make your own uh, decision-making processes on that data, which Google could do if they do it, do it at the same time. It could be a nation state that says every phone call has to be 10 phone calls. Right? Every email has to be 30 email. Every Facebook post has to be, and so forth. Right? So it's a, it, that's a, that's a, I mean, there is computa a computational or um, a computer science debate on that that's been ongoing for a long time, at least 20 years, maybe even longer, because I believe there's some hints that this was employed in, in um, submarine warfare already in the 60s. Right? So there's a couple of people who thought about these things for a longer time, uh, than, than, than we are aware of. Um, that literature needs to be reviewed and needs to be translated into policy options. Um, and that's the work that's, I think, that needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Um, for, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions from the room. Um, just as a brief uh, like pointer for Q&A, Bef like before you ask, ask a question, it would be great if you could um, say your name and your affiliation. Um, and so please uh, keep questions brief and ensure that there are also questions with kind of like a question mark at the end. Um, so yeah, with that, does anyone have any questions for Christoph? Yeah, yeah hi, my name is Veronica Thiel. I'm currently an advisor with Algorithm Watch. Um, I've got a question sort of generally around sociometrics graph analysis. Um, what you describe is obviously quite a lot of technical connections that you can see IP addresses and so on and so forth. But there's always an element of human interpretation in that. So an example that I know from HR software trying to map team structures, that the example was that you could try and map who's emailing whom and then you do a network analysis and it turns out there's this one email that's included in every single conversation, yeah. but it turns out it's the admin who books all the rooms for the meetings. Yes. So my question is, how do you ensure that there is no bias in the analysis? You get correlations, but not necessarily causations. Yes. Thank you. Yes, um, that's a thorny question. And um, there's a paradox in there. Because um, of course what you have, if you want to rest legal decisions, on something like that, right? Um, you want to have a, um, uh, how do you call this actually? You want to have a clear um, uh, address or a clear um, identity there, right? That's, that's legally viable. And um, there's many ways how you could try to do that. Um, but everything that you do that strengthens um, privacy 
which leads to, which, well, sorry, I'm stumbling here. Let me start again um, by using this. And then I get to the point with the privacy. These guys have this problem too. The general problem you have with all digital media is whose hands are on the device. Because what you want to identify when you identify a persona is a body, right? Because the body is what the law operates on. Because the body is that what goes into jail or in this case gets killed, right? Um, behind the body or uh, alongside the body, there is a couple of legal abstractions that point to the body. The most important one is the signature, which by German law has to be handwritten. It's a trace of the body and there is a lot of um, you know, legal discourse about this problem. How do you actually uh, know that a Willenserklärung, the declaration of a will, is connected to an individual and, and this you know, trace of the body on the paper is important in that. Right? Um, the other, th other things are the mail address, the postal address, and so forth. They all basically have to lead to a, to a body. This gap between the paper and the body, where there are many instruments in the history of, 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 of legal media that try to close that, um, reappeared with digital media. As I said, you don't know whose hands are on the keyboard or on the, on the touch interface and so forth. And there are many attempts to close that. Biometrics is the most prominent one, and biometrics has certain disadvantages. Um, but they all try to make sure that a certain body can be related to a certain data activity. Right? Um, social network analysis uh, creates something like a relational identity over time. What you try to do is you try to exploit the... the um, uh, the communication data and infer who is who. That is what Binet showed with the zone of sub suspects and so forth, right? Legally, that's not viable because you cannot, it, has, it doesn't have the same legal value as a mail address, a postal address, or a signature. Um, so this would need to be solved, right? But this was, would lead to a situation where you would create government issued digital identities, which then would be graphed out, which when, then would make this whole geopolitical dimension, the inter international relations dimension, even more difficult. Unless you obfuscate um, by whatever means, um, the legal identities of the, of the individual, of your population that you assigned these identities. So, Data protection and privacy based on encryption actually creates stronger addresses that make it way easier to graph out people. And that's the paradox I was trying to get at. Thanks. Any other questions from the room? Yes. Um, my name is Tante. I'm part of the Otherwise Network. Um, you kept talking about the graph as an entity is like a map of reality. Yes. And that's what all the materials that you presented uh, yeah. also hint at. Like we shape the graph to shape reality. We make sure that the graph is as correct as humanly yes. possible. But um, if, we, if we look at the graph as it is probably being used, it's more like a temporal structure. It's not yes. the graph that is the truth, it's about I have the truth now, I have a truth last week, I have a truth yes. three years back. So it's not really, it, it feels like either that is not yet a topic that you want to look at the way that the graph shapes, or do people really just care about the now in this mm. narrative? Um, as with all computational means, these are abstractions that um, uh, slice away those parts of reality which are not computable, right? Um, or make, you know, need too much storage runtime or whatever. So um, that's, that I think is a given, right? That this is, a, this is not the reality, but um, 
they have emerged as means um, that are quite workable to, you know, to uh, obtain or follow certain goals. And of course, they shape reality, right? And um, so I'm not sure if, 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 it's, if it would be helped if um, we would add more reality to graphs, if that's what you're saying, right? Um, you would still have these uh, strategic interests at work in this context. I think that's a general problem with computation, and that, that's a question, I mean, that's essentially a question about ontology, um, and the ontology of computing on, on the other hand, and um, my approach is to try to avoid these. I know that's not satisfying, um, but to describe the dynamics that the computation and ontology generates, and then try to interfere in that. Uh, yes, back in the back, please. Um, hi, my name is Paul Ledoué. I'm a member and founder of Personal Data at IO. Um, I was also very involved uh, at the very beginning with uncovering the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So your reference to the logo, for instance, was yeah. something that 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 uh, that was very interesting to me as well. This notion of a global brain um, yeah. and uh, this this introspection and at the same time extrospection in a sense. Um, but the, the links go much, much further with Cambridge Analytica than what you, what you explicitly said. I'm sure you're aware of this. Um, there are targeted audience analysis throughout Afghanistan, for instance. Yeah. But um, in, uh, in, in, um, in working on this scandal, covering it with many, many people involved on Twitter and trying to find as much information as they could, it also felt as being part of a graph of people who yeah. were trying to figure out what this whole thing was about. Mm -hmm. And so this, this informed a little bit my reaction now. So what I'm now doing is building explicitly a graph for civil society of these actors, all of those different platforms and the information that transits through them. And this is where I get to my question or my, my, me asking for a comment. I think something that you didn't touch on here is an additional graph of the semantics of what transits all over the place. It's not just between whom, um, be like what information, sorry, it's not just nodes of people that transit information or organization, but it's also um, a graph of complexity of the information that transits. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had any, any comments on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, and let's talk. I would, learn, would love to learn about uh, Cambridge Analytica. Um, uh, just, just a side note on the logo. Um, that's probably um, uh, inspired by the connectome, uh, because graph theory also made quite an impact in neuroscience, because um, after they had all these MRI scans and other means that helped you uh, to uh, create pictures, of the brain, somebody noticed, well, maybe this, this idea of, of a map with locations that light up when there's some activity is not the whole brain. Uh, we could also graph out the connections between uh, synapses uh, across the brain. So you, f you trace out the neurons as edges and the synapses as nodes, and then you get, Google it, it's called connectome you get very funny pictures of how the brain looks like. And of course, it shows that the musician's brain has a completely different connectome than whatever a soccer player's game and so forth. There's probably, they were probably also inspired by that. Um, it just shows that graph theory is such a powerful epistemology that's being applied everywhere. To your question, um, I'm not sure if I really understand what you mean by the semantic complexity that's around. Uh, is that about... Um, creating an informed discourse uh, and measuring the different levels of complexity in, in, in the discussions people have, or wh what are you trying to refer to? It's about complexifying the relationships between the data points themselves. So what would that mean? So that would mean that you, you start building meaning about what a data point means, sorry, so yeah. what, it, what it refers to. Uh, so it's, it's this the fact that we exchange a phone call yes. 
um, that is just a basic fact. The fact that we exchange a phone call and we're located at the same place a month later, two, the two together mean something more. And this becomes more and more complex information progressively. Sorry, Another do you mean metadata? Yes. Metadata is, is um, it's in some ways too simple of a term because that metadata itself has structure. And so it's, it's, it's just new data that can, on which you can infer more things. Um, another way to, say, to see it and linking back to this logo is, um, of course, it's not just networks in our brains that think in this context. It's also artificial neural networks, again, the graphs, right? So, so this, these are trying to make sense of all those data points. And um, at first, in the first layer, you just have data points. But what information do you have five layers down or the last layer before it makes a decision? This carries more and more semantic yes, meaning yes, yes. about what those data points are. There's a lot of structure there, a lot of graph structure that is extremely important. Yeah. But is the general idea to expose um, the graphs that, that are generated on different levels whenever you have some sort of uh, um, conversation or contact and so forth to the entities involved to make that available? So this is a possibility, yes. Um, okay. So if, for instance, in, with a perspective of watching algorithms uh, making decisions, trying to find out if they are discriminatory or not, um, they make a recommendation. That's a decision that is based on several layers of, of, of deep learning networks most of the time. Um, if there was an obligation to expose the last two layers to the individual on which a decision is made, um, this would carry much more information yeah. that the company might not necessarily have made sense of, right? A lot more information about the way the decision was taken. Um, it's just raw, raw facts. Uh, at some point in the algorithm, the value there was this much. No one knows yeah. what it means. But yes. civil society could band together and start forming cohorts that would go through those systems and could yeah. audit it because we would have more information about the context of the individuals. Mm -hmm. And we might be able to find whether those systems mm -hmm. are discriminatory, for instance. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, over there, please. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Anna Loop. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate at University of Southern California. Um, it's interesting that you brought up Palantir, um, and I've been really, I, I would like to hear your thoughts around the, the lawsuit that happened between that Palantir sued the U.S. Army um, around software development and how they actually won um, that landmark case and then proceeded to receive an 800 plus million dollar uh -huh. sort of... <laughs> Um, contract from the army to then deliver on sort of software that's based on the Gotham uh, sort of graphing um, software that you talk about here. And so I was wondering, you know, if you had followed that and sort of, you know, what that means around, you know, sovereignty and state power and how, you know, these, you know, thinking about these private companies that are now able to sue, right, <laughs> um, you know, a, a military entity and clearly win. Um, and how that impacts, right, you know, the possibilities yeah. and the potential, you know, for how graphing can be yeah. used from private to public yeah. from a policy-making perspective. Um, I actually don't, I didn't follow that law, lawsuit, so I don't know. Um, but I think the larger context here is the control of sensitive technology. And... Um, I'm not sure if we could find a historical example that that works with this, right? Because this infrastructure is pretty big. Um, and it's not like, you know, the atomic bomb that you can hide in some desert uh, and, you know, build a wall around and have people that work on it uh, not talking to anybody and so forth. Um, this, is, uh, this is definitely different in, in its scale. Um, I think, I mean, what you can see is, and it this would be an interesting graphic problem, you can see a circulation of people between Google, Facebook, and all these companies, certain universities, certain um, military academies, 
um, and certain military companies. You know, you will, you will find somebody work for a while at, at Facebook, then they are at the Network Science Center so-and-so, then they go to Raytheon, then they go and so forth. So this knowledge travels. And it would be probably doable to graph that out and see over time who went where and how, you know, how th certain ideas uh, circulated uh, in the US um, military industrial complex. Um, and there's other signs for example, there is the NSA Accumulo uh, database project, which is an open source database project where they, I forgot actually what it was, what is, I have to look this actually up because it was an interesting, they used an open source, I, I believe it was a key value store uh, database project and they had this problem that they need to control access to the data. So you have security clearances that need to be somehow represented in the, in the database. Uh, so you need to be able uh, to manage access to certain uh, data. And this Accumulo, um, its, it's host an Apache uh, database would provide that. And there's an active open source development going around that. So you can see there's, you know, the, it goes deep into the open source community, into the, into the, into the platformers. Um, there's a lot of ideas and people circulating around. Okay, I think there was another question there. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Uh, I'm Rick Bahage from the Computer Professionals Union in the Philippines. Uh, I also work with graphs for a telco previously, mm -hmm. so I'm kind of familiar with how the work, how the graphs works, and how it's how it's, how difficult it is to process. Uh, if you have got like uh, more than a hundred uh, nodes, it's going to be very difficult to process, but it's doable. <laughs> I've also doubled with temporal graphs for the time. Um, my, my, my curiosity is on uh, why, because technology, there's always a positive and a negative side. Yes. Yes. Graphs is, I would view it as a, an algorithm, so you can use it to process, to, you can use it as a tool to say, uncover corruptions, yeah. say, in a, in a, in a uh, government spending, maybe find who are monopolizing, monopolizing uh, contracts. So there's a way to, to make it in a positive way. There's also this bad way, the way you, you presented it. Um, I'm also working with civil society on trying to make uh, data and algorithms um, more of uh, be responsible or, or, or useful to, to, to the people. Uh, my question is, um, do you think it is time now to, to say, to put forward some way of, of the people or, or the users trying to have some, some sort of sovereignty or personal, personal control on the data that they are sharing or being forced to share with platforms? and to have some control on those algorithms in such a way that, uh, uh, yeah, there's some sense of still of some, some privacy and, and, and protection on, on the side of the, of, of the people. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I mean, of course, my, the way I uh, put this uh, out here uh, was, of course, um, depicting this as a negative development, right? And it, you know, put the big scarecrow up and then, okay, well, what, what now, right? And I, I believe still that's very important to, to, to come to terms with the dimensions these things have. Um, that doesn't mean that we could think or should think about positive uh, applications of graphs and, and, and how they could look like. And probably one distinction that, that is important in this context is I talked here about more or less international relations, right? Um, and how they are shaped or, you know, altered uh, with this technology. And it's probably really difficult to, to come, to, to develop a positive idea here, right? Uh, because what we're dealing with is, uh, is nation state competition and the potential of violence. Um, which, which is part of nation state competition. Um, when we shift the perspective uh, to, um, let's say, internal politics, 
right? What could a country do with a graph? Um, that's different. Uh, China would be the probably negative example again because um, their idea is to allocate um, social goods on the basis of individual behavior, which is enabled by graphing out these individuals, partly enabled. Right? Um, one of the policy questions for uh, social politics could become, can be a similar form of individual allocation uh, be developed um, that still would um, satisfy our ideas and idea, uh, our ideals and, and, and desires for a socially just society. Right? What would that mean for solidarity, subsidiarity, and so forth? It's not clear. Right? But that's a debate that's definitely coming too. Once, once uh, that this knowledge perlocates in the right places, people will make noises in that direction, and uh, we should be ready for that. Right? It's difficult because. Um, it makes the in, it responsibilizes the individual. You become more responsible for the social good than you are already, right? So aggregates also have have advantages because you are allowed, you know, a certain amount of individual freedom. The prime example is always smoking or other unhealthy behavior, uh, because the solidarity principle will cover that, right? If you can map this individual behavior to um, well, to the eventual social outcomes, the debate about what is just behavior and just policy becomes more difficult, and that's inherent in these things, in this technology. But I, th I believe there's potential there, definitely. Okay, any further questions? Or otherwise, I have some as well. <laughs> Um, I also just wanted to follow up whether you can expand a bit on the domestic implications yeah. um, of these, because you mentioned that earlier in your comment, um, but can you be, could you expand a bit more on how you imagine this happening? And also, as a comment, because I can't not comment on this, um, is that one important thing about social credit, the way it's implemented in China right now, is that it doesn't, it, it simply uses existing court judgments mm -hmm. to mete out punishment to people, and then it's not entirely clear to me how that would be different from and like yeah. the operation of the legal system. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, to the latter question, um, uh, I mean, I started with this angstlos thing on China, and I, I'm, you, you made me aware that the social credit system as it exists in the Western imaginary doesn't exist as a real thing in China. But the interesting part here is, and that's what I try to, to, to point out with this angstlos is, um, that our political thinking is so driven by it by now, right? And um, and it, it kind of like it's um, it generates ideas, right? Um, and probably the way the social credit system is implemented right now is much more mundane than what we think it is, right? And it's probably. Uh, very simple and far below the level of implications that we would uh, see if, if, if something like this really gets employed uh, in this context. Uh, domestic implications, um, that's, that's a difficult question. I mean, a little bit is, uh, I, I touched upon that uh, with my previous answer, social politics, right? How do you manage uh, healthcare? How do you manage um, uh, yeah, what else? Um, let me think. Pro education would be probably a field. Because this question of, you know, you obtain all these informal skills in your life. Um, how do you uh, render that into something that carries a certificate in a society that is so certificate oriented, like the German, for example, where, you know, you cannot say, I can. I'm, you know, I can weld or something. You have to prove that you have a Schweißschein you know, welding certificate, right, and so forth. So, you could think about these things that that you know, skills that you pick up 
in some kind of informal context become formalized um, to a larger extent, or are easy, you know, could be more easily in, included in your resume or something like that. Um, but probably one of the more, or not more important, that's wrong, um, uh, probably something that gets more traction if you would um, have data journalists use these tools to, to show more clearly, to provide something like dynamic maps of how certain semantics, certain topics circulate and which groups um, uh, uh, talk to, to whom about what. I believe, I'm not sure, it's probably something big uh, publishing houses already do. Right? I mean, you could try to have something like a Qualitätsjournalismus graph. You know? Who reads um, high quality um, long form content, complex long form content? And what are they interested in? And what are the time frames that you have to feed them? I mean, Spiegel Online one of the biggest uh, German uh, news websites, knows exactly how often they have to do gender, how often they have to do Apple, how often they ha have to do cars, and so forth, in order to generate traffic. Right? And they probably can see that this subgroup that is interested in cars and Apple is also interested in blah, blah. Um, that's strategic knowledge about public discourse uh, that probably should be public. You, should, you, know, you could have something like a discourse radar or something like that. Um, which, of course, would have unintended consequences and blah, 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 but it's fun to do. So, but assuming maybe, I don't know, oh, sorry, was so, there, yeah. was that a follow-up directly on the? No, no, no. Uh, okay, I just have a follow-up yeah. on this. So, if, assuming that you speak mostly about civil society um, applications, but what if, um, if states start domestically graphing their own populations, and, for example, using those connections um, to determine, for instance, who is a suspect, right? So you had, you had this example earlier, where if you're two nodes removed mm. from someone yes. who is a known, yes. um, then suddenly you also become a suspect. Um, is it, would it even still be possible to have individual legal protections, or would we need a new legal framework for dealing mm. with um, like a state vision of its population like this? Ooh, um, good question, I don't know. Um, I mean, these things are getting, the Bundeskriminalamt does this already, right? I mean, you, you buy Palantir and you get that. Or you have somebody bake you something from some university. And it's, I mean, this is, this is not really complicated to do. The complications is, is, is actually, is really in, in relating this to this legally valid, right? The, basically, the digital address a person has and the body. That's, that's, that's difficult. Um, and usually done by other means than this. Um, so I think these technologies are already employed by many companies and also, I mean, a little bit to what Tanta said, there is not this one graph. There's t t thousands of graphs. You know, every institution probably that is within this um, uh, sphere of you know, military, intelligence services, and so forth, have their own thing. CIA has one, the NSA has one, the NSC has one, and uh, all these three-letter agencies, right? And they probably have a discussion about which one should be the graph, the graphs, all graphs, or so forth. I mean, that, there's, there's complications in that, too. Um, so, I, I, if that, I mean, that's part of, of criminal investigation and been for a long time. There is actually pre-computational graphs where people try to do this on paper, right? um, uh, which you can do with small numbers. It's, uh, you, don't, you don't get very far, but it can be helpful to do that. Right? Um, the, the question is, which outside of law enforcement, which um, public institution, which part of public administration should do this and why? That's the question. And that's, I don't know. I mean, you could say health insurance should do this. Uh, you could say uh, the social services should do this. I don't know. 
Ja? You could say that uh, the digital ministerium uh, managing fake news should do this. Right? And then you have the question, how do they relate to each other? Does it play a role when you smoke and uh, like fake news? Is there any, what, you know, implications does it have? But that's the question. Who can, should, can and should do this and why? That's, that's, that's the policy question. Hi, um, Michael Seemann from the Otherwise Network also. Um, first I would say um, the application of graphs in the domestic realm is really more threatening to my point of view um, because it's more threatening when the state really uses that to shape like their um, uh, domestic population um, it's even more threatening than the geopolitical level, which I want to uh, go back to because um, I have another question because um, when you think about this shaping operations and graphing operations, um, I have the um, intuition that democracies are much more vulnerable to these things. Um, yeah. When you remember back uh, to the... Uh, you, you already mentioned um, that... Um, like meme wars and uh, fake news uh, things can be viewed or can be operationalized as a um, shaping operation. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm very cautious to these claims that the Russian really turned over the election in the US in 2016, but um, if we just um, imagine that would happen um, uh, or, or that happened that way, um, then I would say um, this is really a good entry point. This is really a good lever to really interfere into um, somebody else's uh, internal um, politician, political uh, decision making is to, um, to meddle into the elections and in terms of really shaping um, um, different graphs there. Uh, what would you say to this? Yeah, I mean, how do, how do you want to do that? That's like having no Westfernsehen in the GDR, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's what I tried to say in this one slide, um, that you get into this tension between the desire of have, having open movement of information, people and goods, uh, and the desire to protect your population from being divided into, into groups that cannot, that don't, don't have consent anymore. Uh, yeah, j just the question: um, Are you? Do you think that um, like democracies are in this yeah. um, thing in, in a disadvantage um, because they are more vulnerable to shaping operations, or, or that shaping operations really do matter in a democracy more than basically in an autocratic system? Um, the easy way would out would be why? Why do you ask that? I mean. Um, what, what's your intu intuition here? I think they are more vulnerable, uh, but it's really difficult to answer why. You know what I'm trying to say? Um, yeah. Basically, um, when you think about democracy, like um, just um, the power of the people deciding where um, a nation state should, should go, um, then... Um, the graphing uh, and the graph of like who is in with which party, who is affiliated or who is in which milieu is a much more, yeah, greater lever, I guess. It's, it's, yeah. really, it's really about um, leveraging, yeah. um, leveraging this knowledge um, gives you more advantage in a democracy than in, uh, in an autocrat system way. Um, maybe um, you, um, you could also argue that autocratic systems are more vulnerable in terms of that you uh, really need to um, graph fewer people in order to um, like make, uh, make shaping de decisions, but you also have less of a lever, I guess, um, uh, when you don't have like drones at your yeah. supply. <laughs> yeah, you have to, you have to uh, graph out fewer people because it's hierarchical and that's easier, right? Um, I think the fundamental question here is, I mean, in democracy, there was this piece in the Atlantic recently, democracy relies um, on the consent of those who lost, right? Uh, if you lose an election, um, 
you accept for four years, however the legislator is, however long it is, that you lost, and then you get the next chance and so forth, right? Um, and this author made the argument uh, that this consent uh, is not there anymore. And that is becoming a problem for a uh, democratic so society like the US. Um, and if there's anybody who chips away on that consent through shaping operations, you, you are in trouble. Right? This is basically what, what we're trying, the, the, the current situation we are imagining at least happening. Um, and how do you deal with that is really difficult. Again, because you have to control information flow then. You know, you have to either um, have your country go dark um, or you have to have something like an information audit or whatever you want to call it. Um, I believe that's in a political debate in, in Germany now to, you know, to distinguish between good and bad news and uh, institutionalize that to some extent. Not sure if that works. Let me give you a different answer of, of that, that's a little bit, that's again pessimistic. I'm here for the pessimistic part. Um, if it's true that a graph needs liveliness um, and effect lead to engagement, what you have to do on a graph is to create affects. It's kind of like affect management, right? It's affect bewirtschaftung. So that's what many people do. That's what Don Alfonso does. does. You know, there's, there's some people... Nobody knows Don Alfonso. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you know? There's individuals who manage to capture people's affects um, and uh, are able to, to, um, to stir them, to, to make them engage and, uh, and generate traffic on these graphs. Complex information, that's why I asked uh, the person over there, uh, complex information, complex discourse what does complex discourse do with effects? It, I don't know, you wanna, if you want a nerdy term, it fractalizes them, right? It makes them break into ever more little things and you can see a little bit of anger there and a little bit of fear there, a little bit of hope and so forth, right? So that, that probably doesn't lead to much engagement. People click less if, if, if they're better informed, it would be would be a thesis here, right? So those who create more effects have more leverage, and that's a problem. And, and that's, that's, I think, how you could also describe the media landscape right now. Companies that have understood, okay, affect the wirtschaft, that's our business, Fox News and whatever, right? Uh, and companies who try to figure out how to do this in the other way. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks. I think uh, ending on that. Oh, sorry. I think uh, given that the lunch break is going on right now, um, <laughs> I'm sorry for ending on that pessimistic note. But as Christoph said, uh, he's here for the pessimism. Um, I wanted to thank everyone again for coming. Um, and if you have any other questions, I'm sure he'll be around uh, yes. for those questions and for discussions in person. So thanks again so much. Thank you. Thank you.